tonight is also uh, Bill Bates from the Brute Brisbane Tea Also, Good evening, Bill. Good evening, David. Um, and everybody, our special guest tonight is Jean Tunney. Now, Jean is a uh, former Australian Treasury official and um, currently works as a director of Adept Economics, uh, which is an economic consulting firm in Brisbane. Um, he, himself and the consultation firm is recognised internationally for their expertise in economic policy analysis and advice. Uh, Jean has also, just recently, in the, in the last few years, in the late 2018, released a book called Beautiful One Day Broke the Next, Queensland's Public Finances, since Sir Joe and Sir Leo. Uh, Jean, thank you for taking time out of your week and your evening to uh, join us tonight, and uh, welcome. Thanks, uh, David, and thanks, Bill. You're, look, it's a real pleasure, and this is an issue that is of great interest to me. I'm <coughs> originally from Townsville, so I spent the first 15 years of my life in Townsville. I attended Kerwin Primary School, Kerwin High School for a while, and uh, you know, very familiar with the region and want the best for it. And, yes, I want to chat with you about the possibility of a North Queensland state, what the issues are. Oh, mate. And, so very keen to chat. And, mate, we, we, we always enjoy the conversations we have with our guests, regardless of if they're more inclined to say that it's a bad idea or a great idea. And, obviously, we, we're out in the open. We think it's a great idea in the way forward for Central and North Queensland. But, obviously, it's 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 even better to speak to people like yourself to really nut out the uh, intricacies of things like economic development and the, uh, the pros and cons when it comes to... Uh, what is currently viable and what might be problems faced in the future. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and we might as well get started because, Gene, I'm very curious. I, I must apologise. I knew about your book um, that you released in late 2018 for quite a while now, and I've never actually had the chance to purchase one and spend the time reading it, which I would be very look forward to sometime in the near future. But can you give us a brief rundown in um, your research that came about for that book and explain to us why uh, finances in the Queensland state has essentially changed uh, I would I would argue certainly in in negative terms for Central and North Queensland in terms of uh, expenditure, but how do you find the current situation that's exacerbated to the point where we've got ninety five billion dollars plus in debt or or, or forecasted? What, what are your thoughts on that situation? Okay, thanks, David. Yes, to an extent, the the increase in debt we're seeing at the moment due to COVID is inevitable in a way because of the the massive economic downturn we're, we've experienced. What I would have liked to have seen is the government having taken action a bit earlier and having managed its expenditures a lot better so we weren't in a situation where the, the debt was, well, a lot larger than it had ever been before and therefore the debt servicing cost was higher. So I would have preferred that we better managed our expenditures. So what I looked at in that book was how we went from a situation where Queensland was very well run financially and, and that was under a range of governments of different persuasions. So it was both the Conservative, the Alki Peterson government, it was the Goss government, the Bordage government and then the early part of the, uh, the Beattie government too, but then something went wrong in the 2000s and we had these massive overreactions, political responses to crises. We had a health crisis, a water crisis and an electricity crisis. And since then we've just accepted more and more debt. So I, I argue that, you know, something went wrong in that, the mid 2000s in that decade. And that's, uh, that's given us more debt than we, we had in the past, a higher debt servicing bill. It's still something that can, that is still manageable. I mean, the, uh, I mean, the government's been lucky that interest rates are so low. So the, the debt burden is, in terms of its burden on the budget, is much higher than it was. But at one and a half billion dollars per annum, it's still manageable when you've got Revenue of nearly 60 billion, much less this financial year due to COVID, but it is still something that's manageable. The risk is in the long term, if you just accept this ever growing debt, then if you're in a situation where interest rates 
increase and you need to refinance that debt, then you could be in a lot of trouble. So I think it's about managing the risk. I think we do need to eventually get this under control. I was concerned that the previous government, or the previous treasurer, and the treasurer before, uh, Jackie Trad, really didn't have a, a real plan to to uh, you know get the debt under control. And we'll need to see what Cameron Dick comes out with at the when he releases the budget in or the budget update in September. Won't be a full budget. We need to see what his long-term plans for stabilising that debt. Especially, yes, yeah, it's, that was a fantastic point because I mean, COVID itself this year has thrown so much into chaos, and and own, anybody should be understanding to the fact that, it, that any any budget should be blown out by circumstances like COVID nineteen. But look, I want to I want to based on the fact that you mentioned him as well. Like I've I actually saw an interview on TV where Cameron, uh, sorry, what's what's the representative's name? Uh, Dick, the new treasurer. Uh, Cameron, isn't it? Cameron, yeah. Dick, yes, yes. Uh, he actually said himself in the open interview, even though he was asked a question about the existing debt in Queensland, that but debt is a good thing and it can be serviced well. I mean, what are your thoughts when the... I mean, sure, he got thrown into the role due to circumstances like Jackie Trad having to step down, but what are your circumstances... What, what are your thoughts when a treasurer that's been put in that situation is of the basis that don't worry about $95 billion of debt, uh, it, all is fine, debt is good. What are your thoughts on that? I'd have to look at exactly what he said. I, I hope he wouldn't have said said it quite that way. That doesn't sound too good how he's expressed it. So some debt can be good, of course, if of you're course, using yep. it to borrow. If you're borrowing money to finance investment in a, a worthwhile project or an asset. The, the problem state governments have, though, is that, and this is why previous Queensland governments have been, been very frugal, the state government can go and borrow money and invest in a new road or, say, a, a new dam, but it may not recover the... It may not earn a return on that that's sufficient to help service the debt, and that's traditionally been a problem. So it's been very focused on... Uh, traditionally, so under Leo Hilscher, who was the under-treasurer in the mid, from the mid 70s to around 88 and, and Leo was basically Joe's right hand man for a long time, or, or one of them very close to Sir Joe. And when Sir Joe broke up the coalition agreement, Leo ended up effectively being state treasurer. So he's incredibly powerful. His view was that you have to be very careful because you could be investing in assets that aren't necessarily returning money, well, a lot of money to the budget, particularly roads and bridges and things like that, unless you put a toll on them. And so that's why Leo was very, well, he was in favour of uh, putting a toll on the Gateway Bridge <coughs> So when that was built. So there was this attitude that if you want to invest in infrastructure, it should be an economic infrastructure that can help pay for itself. So they were very reluctant to borrow. Yes. But, you know, there could be returns beyond the commercial returns and that, that would justify investment, but you, there's, there's, there has to be a limit to that. You, the, the risk to the state government is you do a lot of investment, you don't get the money back in to help uh, to help service that debt. Yes, but us in central and northern Queensland. Were you going to say something there? Yeah, sorry, I was just about to say it's it's, it's a valid point, and 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 it's no wonder that uh, Sir Leo and Sir Joe back in those days had the uh, the conversation about the fact that uh, I guess I don't I, I don't know if the correct term is the I guess frozen capital in in, a, in investment of of something that doesn't necessarily have a return. I, I, that's probably an incorrect use of the term. You could correct me uh, with your experience there, but I guess the point is is you mentioned how that, that investment doesn't necessarily create economic activity, whereas if you wanted to spend the money on creating a... Oh, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it doesn't create economic activity. No, well, of I'm course. I'm saying that the state government's share of it is not necessarily that high. So No, that's correct. Um, but that's... I was, I was look, about consider to... Consider that... Yeah. No, continue your thought. Continue your thought, mate. Oh, just consider that the bulk of the additional tax revenues that are generated uh, by any project will go to the Commonwealth. So it's the Commonwealth that collects the income tax and company tax, and then some of that, 
of course, will come back to us via the GST Grants Commission, yeah. via the redistribution. Yeah, that's oh, right, yeah. GST. But, yeah, the, the problem is the actual direct budget impact, the direct revenue gains to the state may not be that large. And so that's why I think in previous, uh, you know, decades, Queensland governments were very reluctant to to borrow money. And also, I guess another point to consider is that international capital markets weren't as developed, as well developed as they are now. 100% agree. And, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, Leo tells stories about when he had, he was at a, he had to go to a meeting in Canberra of the, I think it was the Loans Council and uh, Robert Menzies was <laughs> presiding over it. So, you know, Leo goes, goes back to those days and uh, where the states had to get Commonwealth approval for borrowing and then gradually they started to borrow on their own but then they had to, you know, there was a lot of legwork involved, trips to Japan and trips to the US to, to market the, uh, uh, well, to, you know, to convince investors that uh, Queensland was a, a, a worthy... Uh, were the state to and, lend to. Yeah, and in, now, it's and a lot in those years, it was a lot easier for state. Yeah. Yeah, no, sorry, I was a bit, and in those years it obviously worked because we saw a growth, especially through the Joe Bielkus and Peterson years, it was fantastic and, uh, there's, there's many a central and north Queenslander that look, revere the man for what he's done for the whole of the state, which leads us, leads us into the current situation we're in now, which, um, I guess I used the wrong term by saying economic activity when it comes to investment in infrastructure because I guess what I was, my, my thought was is, Take the Cross River Rail, for example. It's not necessarily wealth generating mm. in itself. It does generate activity, especially through the construction of it. But this, this, at the same token, the amount of investment that could be done would be nowhere near the expenditure for something like the Cross River Rail for a dam, for all sorts of infrastructure for central North Queensland that could boost both uh, agricultural capacity as well as uh, pastoral, as well as mining. I mean, it is... It is, it is one of those things. Mining requires everything from water all the way up to better roads and better railways. But what, what is the, the concept that the governments should think now that creating debt that is non-serviceable, serviceable to an extent through the creation of an asset like a cross river rail that it would be to expanding the agricultural area of a certain, certain part of central North Queensland through a dam. That, that's, that's more of my thinking that I meant by that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's hard to provide you know, general rules for this sort of thing. I think you need to assess each project on a case by case basis. That's fair enough. And this yes. is why it's important to have. Yeah, this is why it's important to have a process like what Building Queensland does, where it's rigorously assessing projects. With Cross River Rail, I was a bit sceptical about whether that was necessary or not. It was never obvious to me that. That was a necessary project, and it could be that COVID completely ruins the uh, viability of that project. Because I think the stats I heard on the radio today, I think public transport's running at <coughs> might be 50% of the capacity of that uh, compared with where it was pre-COVID. So numbers are way down because people are very worried about catching. Coronavirus. Road traffic's probably around 80 percent, or a bit more of where it was before the the virus. So, and and we're obviously yeah, entering into a post-COVID really sort of. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just was, I wanted to add on to that that we're also entering into a time yes, yes. post-COVID. So it'll only probably uh, make more people weary of catching the, the the train in itself as well. Sorry, continue. Oh, potentially, and we're, we're thinking more about working from home, exactly, and, and people are figuring out that, you know, that can work. That's We can make working from home work, which would raise more questions about the viability of uh, Cross River Rail. Now, with the dam, look, it could be that some of these dams that the opposition is talking about, they could be economic, I don't know. I think the, they need to crunch the numbers. The risk is... is there's a risk that if they build these dams and they try and run them as as businesses, so they if some water owns the dams or if they have another company that builds and, and owns the dams, then that could end up losing money. They might not be able to recover 
or they might not be able to charge the irrigators enough to you know, help pay for the, the dam in the long run. And so that could end up costing the budget. So I'd be concerned about building white elephants which have that ongoing cost to the budget. Uh, what I'm saying is yes. we need to carefully assess all of these projects. I'm not, I wouldn't want to say, look, we should never invest in, in this type of project or that type of project. We really need to have a close look at it, assess each on its merits. And that's 100%. You need to take uh, the horse for the course. And if, if what, what, what may be a great idea in one sense is not necessarily great in another. But uh, like even with the thing with the dam, the water is one component because there is a possibility, if it was the correct sort of dam, that there might be a capacity for energy creation as well. So there's a multifaceted style of wealth generation from one, one large investment like a dam, and it's it's always a simple example when it comes to the the semi-arid areas of central North Queensland to use a dam as an example. So, it's 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 not one to funnel down to one singular example. Everything needs to be based on its own merit, um, and that's 100% fair enough. But you could definitely argue that with the sort of forward thinking, like from the years of Sir Joe, when those sort of projects were predominantly undertaken for the benefit of the whole state, um, it was better for the whole state economically at least. Um, the only problem is now is the gerrymander's gone, and with, an, uh, with a parliament that's predominantly operated with 73 seats in the, centra, uh, the southeast corner, um, Cross River Rail is a big portion of those 73. And for the, for the lack of representation that we have now to the servicing of a, of a huge investment like Cross River Rail, it's starting to be too skewed. And that's why some of us, like myself, like Bill, like many others in central North Queensland, think that the new state's the only way for us to go. But, Bill, have you got a question that you'd like to come in um, and ask, Jay? Yeah, um, I just want to just get a couple of things <coughs> straight. Um, you mentioned that Cameron Dick's uh, revenue base or comment was $60, $60 billion for uh, Queensland. I just got the Treasury figures for 1819 for the uh, revenue uh, for the state, and the total was $42 billion, made up of $19 billion from uh, GST and grants, $11 billion from taxes, uh, user charges were uh, not worth talking about, royalties were $5.1 uh, $5. billion, uh, and then appropriation revenue, which is basically the what the utilities like Ergon, Sun Water, Southwest, Southeast Water, and other other government agencies contribute, and that was another 5.8 billion dollars. So, the, according to the Treasury figures, the the revenue base for actual for 18 to 1819 was 42 billion. Uh, uh, and $411 million. I seem to remember so, it was a bumpy year in resources this year, though, too, Bill. Like, that, like I'm, I'm not sure whether 60 yeah. million is right or 40 million is right, but I, I seem to remember it was a bumpy year for resources this year as well. But sorry, continue. Yeah, yeah but yeah, that, Bill, that, that, that's, that's fast insurance. Pardon? What, what figures are you actually looking at? Sorry. I'm, I'm reading, I'm sure reading out of the uh, Treasury report that's put out every year in September. And they publish the uh, Treasury Department actual um, revenue for for the state. From, that, from that's, 1718. Was 41, what, for, no, well, 1718 was 41 billion, and 1819 was 42 billion. And these are actual figures because there's a delay between ex, uh, estimated and actual, <coughs> and th this report would have been issued in September last year. And it's our annual Treasury document. So I, I'm just just querying the difference between the 60 billion, suddenly $60 billion worth of revenue when when the revenue, according to the Treasury, for the last couple of years has been $41 and, and $42 billion. That, that's one thing. And the other thing is, like, the... The fact that the Commonwealth makes gets the lion's share of major uh, returns for major infrastructure projects through uh, company taxes and also um, income tax and things like that. Well, the thing is, usually for major projects, the Commonwealth is probably stumping up 
anywhere between 50 and 80 percent of the total cost. So the contribution that the state makes is is you know is pretty well dwarfed by the Commonwealth uh, contribution for ma- major works. Yeah, Bill, I'm struggling to find your figure because if you look at the report on state finances, which is I think the report you're talking about, if you look at um, the outcome for 2018-19 on page uh, 3-4, it's got general government sector outcome revenue fifty nine point eight three four billion. I'm just I think we might have to resolve this offline. I'm just not sh- you might I'm just not sure what you're looking at. It might be it might have to do with what's in the scope of the the estimates you're looking at. Okay. So that would yeah. explain that. Yeah. So let, I think it's probably best if we resolve that well, I'll just offline. No, I, yeah, gentlemen, I think I think that's something that if it was a Zoom conversation, we could hold up to the camera, but yeah. uh, we might have to leave that one for another evening. But, Bill, what was the second part of that uh, question? The, the second, it's on page 42 anyway. Yeah. But, the, but the thing is, um, Queensland Treasury Annual Report, 1819. Um, the other part is, in, with regards to major projects, um, the lion's share is usually stumped up by the Commonwealth Government and the, the, the responsibility of the state seems to be in, in for many projects is only 20% of the contribution. So um, they, the Commonwealth obviously takes the lion's share in the company tax and the, and the, and the income tax generated by those projects, but... Um, the, problem, the state's only stumping up 20% for mo- most projects. Yeah, so you're talking about uh, many road pro- some road projects, aren't you, where it's considered a road of national significance? Yeah, and but, it's, you know, but it's, it's also... It's you right also that the Commonwealth with, does that. Yeah. But you also find with projects like um, contributions to, uh, say, the redevelopment of the convention centre in... Um, in Cairns, a good portion of that comes from the uh, is a grant from the Commonwealth as well as state, and then a bit bit from the local government as well. So there's always seems to be a reasonable contribution by the Commonwealth for a lot of projects. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now the state government here has had trouble getting that Commonwealth contribution though for some of its major projects, particularly. Cross River Rail, so it was hoping that if there were a change of government at the federal level, they would get $2 billion coming from the federal government. Now, since Scott Morrison was returned, that was not forthcoming. But, look, generally I agree, the Commonwealth uh, can contribute a substantial amount to projects, and uh, and some of them, if it's, a, if it's considered one of those national roads or road, uh, national highway, road of national significance or whatever the label is, then yes, they'll, they will contribute the bulk of it. So I totally agree with you. The, the, so I, I'm guessing, Bill, are you, trying to, are you suggesting that if you did have a state of North Queensland, then you could, you know, the state, the state of North Queensland could look forward to, uh, to receiving a substan- substantial Commonwealth assistance with infrastructure projects. I take it that's your... Well, what you're oh, yes, yeah. so, I mean, I mean that's common for for all states. There's there's always a significant con- contribution for projects from from the Commonwealth. Um, so yeah, besides, I mean, a good portion of our our budget uh, comes directly from from the Commonwealth in that from that grants commission, including the GST redistribution. And you've got <coughs> situations like Tasmania. You know, I think it's whole annual annual budget sticking to the same sort of figures on and pages that I'm looking at for Queensland, their total budget for for a year is just over five billion dollars. Yet they get three billion dollars dropped on them from the good graces of the mainland taxpayer through the Commonwealth. So, so uh, and and I think that's the common common thread for um, a lot of 
all the states that nearly 50% of their revenue come just gets dropped in their lap, courtesy of the Commonwealth Government. And uh, that probably, to some, some degree, probably makes them a little bit lazy in regards to generating generating wealth themselves because they know that they've got that um, that, that sort of position. I mean, you've got South Australia, I think, that working on the same page again for the, for the revenues for them. I think their total revenue for a year is around about $16 billion and $9 billion comes from the Commonwealth. And... Uh, that sort of situation has allowed, allowed them to do silly things like blow up their coal-fired power stations and now are dependent on feeds from Victoria and, and some wind, wind and diesel generators. Well, I guess we can yeah, always... Sure. Say I mean, there's a big debate about... Sorry, Jane, you, you continue, mate, continue. Yeah, I was just going to say there is a big debate about whether the Greens Commission process does make states lazy. You could you there was a there was a section in the Productivity Commission's review of the Greens Commission methodology a couple of years ago which uh which said that there is I think there's some merit in the argument that it could discourage states from exploring, you know, developing their mineral resources or their gas resources. There's, there's a, one of the points that's made is that, well, Victoria should, well, one of the arguments that's made by some is that Victoria should be penalised for not allowing exploration for, for coal seam gas. I think that might be one of the arguments they make. Well, New South Wales, they're, they're restricting that development. And so, therefore, they should be penalised for that because they're not taking up that opportunity to generate revenue. So, look, certainly there there, there could be something to that point, uh, Bill. It's uh, There's a lot of controversy about that Grants Commission methodology and if you set up a state of North Queensland, then you'd have to have a, a good team of people working on it to make the best case for North Queensland as to why it should get a favourable Grants Commission assessment as possible. One of the things I found interesting is that I think there's more people working on Commonwealth state financial issues in the state treasury here in Queensland than in the Commonwealth treasury because it matters so much to the state treasury here what that relativity is. So what that extra amount of money we get per head of population is than other states. And on average, the last time I calculated it, over the last 20 years, I think we've received a bit about 3% above our, per, what we get on a per capita basis of GST, 3% more than we would otherwise. There have been some years when we've had a lower, a relatively lower than one, when we were penalised for higher commodity prices in the recent past. But on average, we've generally been a net beneficiary of the Grants Commission process. I expect that a state of North Queensland would be because you'd have heavy expenditure responsibilities. You would benefit from, you, well, you would be penalised by the Grants Commission for having uh, the ability to raise money through royalties, yes. And, and this, did, so what's critical is where you draw that line. So what I, what I would suggest, what we need to do is to look at What's the state of North Queensland going to look like? Where are we drawing the line and then crunch the numbers on that basis? I'd like to see what it looks like. And there has to be some detailed analysis of what it means for state government expenses and revenues, what they get from the Grants Commission, what they get from royalties. And bear in mind that if you have royalties, then in years of high commodity prices, in future years, like in a few years' time, you may be penalised for that because the Grants Commission thinks you're doing very well, we'll redistribute some of that money. So there's a lot of complexity that it would be good to try to model and just see what a state of North Queensland would look like. Well, that's, that's a fair I think it would be an too, interesting yeah. concept. I think it would be an interesting concept to see a, a North Queensland uh, state 
uh, and a commodity rich one and then West Australia in the same situation going going to bat together to sort of straighten some of this uh, situation out with, with the Grants Commission. I mean, I'm surprised that New South Wales, you know, puts up with, with the um, getting ripped off all the time. Uh, I think their, their, their uh, share of the GST is uh, way down at about 87 cents in the dollar. I think, I think roughly Victoria's just under a dollar. And then you've got states like Tasmania getting a dollar seventy eight or something and uh, I think I think South Australia's on about a dollar forty and of course uh, the hopeless case of uh, Northern Territory is I think that's up it was up to us about five dollars um, for every dollar of GST they earned. I think it's down to about four something now. So all the all those things sort of just need to be straightened out in regards to uh, forcing the, the states to sort of be a bit more competitive and, and innovative to make sure they can generate their own wealth. And I think that that's going to be one of the greatest advantages for for a new you know, the additional creation of new states. I mean, not just just not just North Queensland, but I think there's a case for. I mean, there's always been a case for. New South Wales splitting into more states down in the Riverina and in the in uh, in uh, north the northeast or, or northern section of New South Wales, but I think I think something like an additional couple of states probably wouldn't hurt the com wouldn't hurt the federation in regards to um, straightening out some of the disproportion that's occurred over the years um, within the federation and and the in sort of in bounce now. Of the activities that the Commonwealth has is now engaged in, that really under Constitution was never supposed to get engaged. I mean, we recently had prior to the last or part of the last last election was the the sports rort. I mean, when a Commonwealth grant, when a Commonwealth government that's supposed to look after defence, immigration, uh, and those sort of things, those major things that are outlined in the Constitution. Starts getting involved with the with the local oval getting a getting a, a change room or a toilet. I think that's just a bit beyond the pale. I mean, they've they've got a job to do, and the states have got a job to do, and they need to go back and have a look at what their responsibilities were under the constitution and this trade off they've had over the years to sort of uh, give give the Commonwealth more this influence, especially under Section uh, 95 of the, of the Constitution, uh, needs to be well and truly addressed. And I think the only way to address that is more states and then states exercising their power under the Constitution to keep the Commonwealth in line. Yeah. Look, I think there'd, be, there'd definitely be benefits from having more states. It's better for democracy. It's better for representation. What we've seen is that there's a growing divide between the the views of people in North Queensland and people in the uh, southeast corner, and that was evident in the last federal election. I think there may well be different attitudes towards economic development. I know that there's a feeling that the North is not treated fairly by the state government, that it doesn't receive its fair share. My own figures would suggest that the ones I've looked at suggest that North Queensland does pretty well out of the state government, but I recognise that that experience, that that's not necessarily the experience of people up there. That's not necessarily the view. It's difficult to compare like with like. So if you look at its capital works spending per capita, it does look like it's three, four thousand dollars in you know, some parts of North Queensland relative to a statewide average of uh, a bit over two thousand, if I remember the figures correctly. But then it could cost more to deliver those to build those capital works in North Queensland. You've got many more kilometres to to cover with roads, so it, it's a difficult comparison to make. If, if I could just jump in there. Um, yeah. 
And, and just add, if, if you could get closer to your microphone, it might help. There's sort of, you're a bit sort of distant. Sure, um, okay. The, I think one of the big problems, I think, think that's one of the big um, clubs people uh, opposing a separate state bring out all the time, especially people like Dr. Paul Williams and says, oh, you know, you, know, you well, you, you, you get more than, more than, more than you, sh- you deserve sort of thing because you get this per capita rate. But well, people need to get, get a proper view of that. Uh, if, you pick, if you pick any major component and major delivery of service, um, it doesn't matter if it's a project or just general delivery of, of health service that exists in or something. What people keep forgetting is that the, what they allocate as the $3,000 per head or something in an area, they also, that, that, compo- that includes components of the money it costs or the money that's given to the southeast administrators in the government oh. to, to um, do all that work. So, the, so all the wages that are contributed there to deliver service in, in North Queensland and Central Queensland, um, the per capita a- allocation goes to North Queensland, but the actual expenditure is in in southeast court in the southeast corner in in Brisbane itself. And then you look at contracts that are, li- are, 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 are raised to provide some of those services or infrastructure in North. Well, a lot of that money is actually One goes to. Um, Multinational or or a Brisbane contract or 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 something like that, and the and the money goes into the economy of wherever that company is, and then, but that but that that money as expended goes into the per capita of people in in central and north Queensland, but you haven't got any wealth benefit out of it yet, and then you go to the other situation where parts of those contracts, like we've got the um, convention centre up here. Now that that's nearly a got a it's 176 million dollar project, but it's likely to blow out say just round figures 200 200 million project. Well, it, it's run by it's the project was won by a southeast uh, company, right? Most of the contracts are, su- are sublet in southeast Queensland or some other part of Australia. Like the four million dollar air conditioning contract was given to uh, well was, was won whatever by a Melbourne company. Now that four million dollars there is got to go into the economy of 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 um, Melbourne. Yeah. They'll they'll do whatever they do, send it up here, and we'll get get some benefit from the installation of that work through through whatever the labour component is. But all that total is credited per he- per capita to us, but it doesn't deliver us any wealth or any growth in our economy. So, so that, that's, that's one of the big furfies of this per capita sort of thing. It's not actually, you're not, they're not actually giving us that wealth. They're just saying, well, this is projects we've done, but the wealth, too bad. It was won by a southeast company or, or, or the administration cost was absorbed by, um, empl- government employees, public servants in southeast Queensland. So, so that's, that's, that's the big furphy with that straight per capita. Capital thing. Now, if we're a separate state, well, we'll run, we'll we'll expend that money here. Of course, companies can win it from out contracts still outside of Central North Queensland. But the bulk of the turnover of, of projects will be resource economy. So that that's one of the big issues I have with that straight comparison where where politicians or opponents to a separate state come out and say, oh, but you get more more money per capita. Well, no, that's just a small portion of it. But going back to the thing that this thing about fair share, I think is the wrong argument for a separate state. The argument for a separate state is representation, representation and representation. Mm-hmm. All, the other th- all the other things are automatically fixed once you're a separate state and your rep- and your representation is fixed. You've got, you, you, you've got a parliament of your own. The politicians, all the politicians are answerable to the people of central and north Queensland. Plus, you've got 12 senators doing the work, hard lifting in Canberra for you. So, I think, think that's, that's the real critical part of this argument is not the fair share and the, and the actual dollars, but the representation and the fact that we've got a million people here. 
and we were only represented by 17 people in the Queensland Parliament, and effectively <coughs> no federal politicians actually belong to North Queensland. They belong to the Queensland Labor Party or the Queensland Liberal mm. Party out of Brisbane, and they're not really looking after our interests. They, they, they run on whatever the policy it comes out of for their Brisbane party, whereas once you're a separate state, well, they'll still have the Liberal Party or whatever, or, or LNP and Labor Party, but they will be the North Queensland Labor Party and, and delivering policies for Central and North Queensland. Right. Okay, Bill. But I just want to respond to that point about that number not taking into account where the money's spent. Look, that's right. You will get an asset valued at X million or X billion in North Queensland, but you're right that a significant share of the, the economic activity associated with constructing that asset, that income could go to another region. Look, that's fair enough. I, I would see that as a separate issue. You're still getting the asset. That what you're saying is that, I mean, you need, this is an economic development issue because it seems like you need more professional services firms, more engineering firms. You need the, you know, major contractors to locate in or to develop in North Queensland. And sure, that could be something that's associated with the the development of a new state. What you'll need to see, I mean, what needs to happen is I think you need to have an in-migration of, uh, you know, more professionals to be able to establish a new government. That's not going to be an easy <coughs> exercise. You'll need to work out how to, or we'll need to work out how to divide up the state assets and also the state liabilities, unfortunately. You'll need to work out new systems. <coughs> You'll need to have your own system of land title, system of natural resource management, financial management. There are a whole range of things to sort out, so you're going to need a strong professional workforce. So setting up a new state, certainly it, it could be an economic boom to the region. They, they could, they, you know, it could improve the, the workforce composition and development of, uh, of major companies. That's, and uh, contractors, that's uh, that's a possibility. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just I'm just wanting to identify that that's a separate issue from the yeah. value of capital. And, and oh, that's, fair uh, that's fair enough. Look, I'll, 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 that's fair enough. Look, that's fair enough, Jean. And um, I think I think Bill's made a very good point there about the fact that it, it, it's some some of the statistics that's come out of politicians from. Uh, whichever government may be in power, especially uh, if, if they're a representative from the southern areas, from the southern electorates, will always say they've got it so good. Look how much. Look at this. Look at this number. Don't don't worry about how intricate it is and, and a measure it is. Just look at this number. But when we when we live up here in Cairns, we understand the simple concepts. When when a representative comes up who may be the minister for health and says, "Look how fantastic it is. Look at all these upgrades that we've done to the hospital. Look how amazing it will be. The fantastic services that will come for the next two decades." And then you look at them and say, "But you sold the airport to get it." You don't. Know, we, some some of us look at it the simple face value that when you take one arm away to build to, to to create a stronger leg, it doesn't really necessarily do us any benefit. Especially when you take away one wealth generating uh, opportunity like the airport to 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 solve an issue like the ever growing uh, need for healthcare in the Cairns region. But gents, look, we're approaching an hour, and I thought, uh, did you have another comment to finish on that, Jen? Because I'd like to take a different uh, sway uh, before we sort of wrap up the one hour that we like to stick to. So, did you have any other co- thoughts on what uh, Bill just mentioned? I'm uh, not on what Bill just mentioned. Uh, the other pro that I would see from having a separate state is that it is consistent with this idea of competitive federalism that we could see a new state of North Queensland filing different approaches. You could trial, you could experiment with different approaches to economic development, different approaches to education and health or other delivery of other public services. And there could be great value in that. Uh, the whole nation could learn from the, uh, the work that you do, the experiments that you run. So I think there could be great value from having 
a state of North Queensland. Yes, and you mentioned the words competitive federalism there. One of the most interesting components is branching back to the conversation we were having about places like Tasmania, like South Australia. Um, that someone for the future of this nation will have to do the heavy lifting to solve all the economic woes of these basket cases. I might be a bit biased there for a place like Tasmania, but they can't keep locking up all of their industry and all of their natural resources and, and not be concerned when they know that everybody else is coming to their, going to come to their aid, especially when it comes to the federal uh, redistribution of the GST uh, revenue. But um, competitive, fe competitive federalism is only a good thing. Uh, it would only be beneficial to central North Queensland to utilise that form of uh, economic growth for this area because we have the potential, and that is one of our biggest qualms right now, is we have the potential that with the lack of representation, and with the lack of a voice in the parliament where, where all the decisions are made for this state, uh, we, we are not fully grasping the destiny that uh, could be grasped in a place like central North Queensland. But, Jean, like I said, I'd like to take a different tack. You yourself, you said you're, a, you, you're born and born and bred Townsville man. What, what age were you when you left? Fifteen. Uh, Fifteen, right. Oh, that's excellent. So you, you obviously went down to... Yeah, so it's a while ago now. Yeah. Well, but um, oh, look, I'm going to make an assumption that you've still got uh, a significant amount of family up there. Is that correct? I have relatives yeah. up there, not a large number. Oh, I that's do correct. have mostly uh, down here and other parts of Australia. But yes, yes, I do have relatives still in towns. No, that's fantastic. Look, I was just going to say, is, look... What's what's the what's the what's the vo what's the word on the street from the relatives when you get to catch up with them? How little are they are? What, do they do they let you know how things are in a place like Townsville now, both economically, socially? Because uh, when I, I was actually going to take a more uh, a fun for, fun way of introducing you, saying you've got a, a rap sheet of accolades that's longer than a North Queensland juvenile offender. So, what, what, when it comes. <laughs> What, uh, what's, what's your thoughts if you, if you do get to catch up with your relatives up here or, or old friends? Uh, do, you, do you hear stories of how people are suffering up here, especially in a place like Townsville? Because when we catch up with people that we know, both through this movement um, as well as just general acquaintances, things are bad, especially in the area surrounding Townsville. Do you hear of these sort of stories? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I do get up to Townsville every now and then and uh, I... I've seen it. I've, you know, I, I've always been uh, disappointed and I've despaired of what what's happened to the CBD of Townsville. I mean, I remember when Sturt Street and Linda Street were thriving in the in the uh, the eighties, uh, and now uh, just all the boarded up uh, shops and vacant shops. It's uh, it's a huge concern. And yes, I'm aware of the, the economic problems in the region. So yes, yes, yeah, I've been picking that up. I've been concerned for a while about the, you know, the lack of some, of investment that's gone into the region. It was a great concern when we had the issues with uh, QNI there with Queensland Nickel. The, I know that there was a, a great period of growth in the, from about the 60s through to the 80s, I think, and maybe from the 50s, we had the, the army invest, come into the region and, and also, uh, James Cook University and then the, all the other government agencies and there was investment going to the region. And, you know, now, yeah, the outlook's a lot a lot worse. There were concerns about the copper refinery a few years ago, weren't there? I'm, I'm unsure exactly what's happening with that, but I do know there are there are big issues in the region. Well, I, I know they had. I, I, oh, look, I, I don't know about the copper refinery that maybe is you, you, you might be mentioning in the towns or there. I, I'm, I'm unaware of that one. I'm sorry, but I, I know that there was issues with the copper refinery that was in Mount Isa. Um, I'm not sure whether one was closed or what one one had to be decommissioned or something, but. Look, it, it, it's, it, I didn't mean to put you in the spot there or anything, mate. It was just, a, I, I, it was one of those questions I was asking because since you said you were from Townsville about the fact that, um, yes, yeah, the, the people that are still there that you might know that are relatives or good friends, it's, it, it's good that they've kept you updated because the simple fact of the matter is, is there, there are certain economic drivers that would solve lots of problems, in my opinion. In my opinion, when it comes to these sort of things like repeat juvenile offenders, uh, we have, I think, I think Townsville might have the, uh, the highest, 
youth unemployment in the whole of the, of, of the nation. I, 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 don't quote me on that. I seem to remember reading something where, uh, there was two, two city, two urban centres in, uh, North Queensland. Uh, one was the highest in the nation and one was, uh, the, the second was, the uh, one of the highest in Queensland also. But ec- economic, uh, economic activity only breeds opportunity and opportunity obviously removes idle hands and I guess there's a multifaceted point when it comes to the creation of a new state, which many of us dwell on, is the fact that I, I, I'm about to have my second child as well. And this is a more on a personal note: is I, I'd, I'd hate for the I'd hate for the only choice for my my daughters to be when they are of that age of 15, just like yourself, which was a while ago now. I know that's not a crack at your age, mate, but it was a fair point that you had to seek education and opportunity in Brisbane, especially education when you were 15, but I don't see any reason why a 15-year-old in 15 years should ultimately have to make that same decision. We are we are in population large enough, we're big enough, we're strong enough, and we're smart enough now, especially with JCU having a presence, Q, QUT is now making a presence in Cairns as well as already having a presence around the state, but what are your thoughts on the fact that based on the differences between when you were a young man of that age and the disparity between problems like youth crime, could you see the benefit of economic activity from the creation of a new state, just as you pointed out as well, um, solving lots of those underlying issues? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I guess that was a long-winded Very, question for yes, a simple yeah. answer. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Because uh, no, I, I will expand on it. Uh, yes, please do. Please point. do. I mean, you do have a lot of a lot of high-quality people, graduates from JCU, for example, and they would have to, if they want to work in economics or finance, they would have to go to Brisbane or or to Sydney, or if they want to work in policy making in the government, they'd have to go to Canberra or, or to Brisbane. If you had your own state and you have all of the the administration of government, then there would be jobs for professionals, for uh, for university graduates, and then also the, the the contractors too. You'd have a greater presence of professional services firms, and you know you'd have uh, related businesses, so businesses which would be supplying to government, and then they would they would you know export out of the region, for example. So yes, it, it could end up having those benefits like that. There's no doubt about that. Mm. So yeah, I agree that it could be. Could be beneficial. Hmm. I guess we need to see whether it. Sorry, continue. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean that could take a long time. One hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Time. Time it, tells it is, everything. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. Uh, it, it, look, it, it could it could ultimately be uh, something that Central North Queensland leads the way in. Uh, the greatest rejuvenation of the Federation since it was implemented, and that's part of the problem. In 1901, when the Federation was created, we have, we have seen no growth, and I think one of the statistics we always refer to to people when we're talking about the specificities of the creation of new states is the best example anybody could refer to is the United States. And from uh, 1901, I believe, to about 1930, I think they created 25 or 26 new states. I can't remember right off the top of my head, whereas we have we have had no new growth in the creation of new states. And ultimately, we can argue that one of the reasons that representation is diminishing in regional area is things like the uh, electoral distribution that's happening in Queensland, where there's more diminishing representation for the for the regional areas purely based on the fact of population of one man, one vote, which is fair enough when it comes to the most simple way of looking at democracy. But when it comes to the overpower and population growth of a place like southeast Queensland, it's draining our not only representation but it's draining the opportunity. And thus also, as you, I think you mentioned just before, draining those specialists, draining those people seeking higher education at more prestigious and illustrious uh, or, uh, educational organisations, draining those people that might actually be the economic drivers of the regions. But if we created a new state and focused through, through also through the, the competitive federalism aspect to try and concentrate more focus on bringing those industries back through tax breaks or whatnot, that's that's another component of competitive federalism that we could easily use to our advantage. Is that correct? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that, but that's why I think it's important to do the the analysis. I mean, you really you really need to crunch the numbers and and work out 
would you be a net beneficiary from the Grants Commission? I expect you would be given the the disadvantaged communities you would have in North Queensland, given the the vast territory in which to provide and to service infrastructure. So I expect you would be a net beneficiary, but it would be good to figure out just how much you would be. And then, yes, work, try and work out yeah, what it all means and just how you would set up that new government and the, the workers you'd need. I think one of the great benefits would come from that in-migration of, of uh, you know, the workers for... The new government, I think, uh, you know, injection of new people uh, and new skills that would uh, that would be a great benefit to uh, the region. You'll need to figure out whether you have Townsville or Cairns as the capital, though. I know that would be a big debate. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's an argument. That's an argument for another evening. And everybody always loves to say their preference. But look, I, I want to ask one more question, which is. Um, to do with the uh, economics of the current state of things in Queensland and what what would be the case possibly in a new state. Then I'll pass to Bill uh, if he's got any uh, last questions before we wrap up the evening. Is we've we've had it on good authority from um, from from conversations with people like Professor David Flint, where there's there's no precedent for the actual transfer of debt like the existing debt in uh, the, the state of Queensland currently uh, that would be pushed upon. Uh, a separated state like that would happen if we had one. Now, at worst, and I seem to remember the conversation with him, um, was if it had to be dealt with by politicians and bureaucrats, at worst, uh, and I think he might have even mentioned something about Geneva Convention, at worst it could only be resolved through um, forensic uh, accounting to to analyse how much expenditure of the existing debt was actually done in Central and North Queensland, and that would only be the parting the parting gift, so to speak, from the existing treasury. Do you um, have any thoughts on that comment? And and could you could you tell us whether that's actually an incorrect statement or, in your mind, possibly true? I think he has a point regarding the general government debt, the debt of the government departments. I think that's a a really good point he's made. I think he has less of a point with the government-owned corporations. So at the moment, around (coughs) half of the debt is on the books of the government-owned corporations, such as Energy Queensland, the various ports. I mean, some of those ports are within... North Queensland, and so therefore you will get the asset, but you also get the debt. You'll, you'll basically get the, the whole government-owned corporation, I expect, because it's within within your jurisdiction. Likewise, I think if you broke up Energy Queensland, or if you recreated Ergon, for example, then they would divide up that company and they'd have a similar gearing ratio or a similar you know, split between debt and equity in the uh, in the new companies, in the two new companies. So I don't think you can avoid the government-owned corporations debt. I think you can probably make a good case for trying to, you know, avoid as much of that general government debt as possible. So it's that general government debt that's blowing out in this COVID time. That's the debt that's going to get up to about $60 billion in a couple of years' time. So I think... You can possibly make a good case. Uh, I haven't heard that argument from David Flint, but I know he's a a very good, uh, he's a, you know, he's a very smart man. So he's a lawyer, is he? I, I assume. Uh, yeah. Constitutional. Constitutional yeah. lawyer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think I've read some of his work. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it, look, it, it it makes sense to me. There's that distinction between the general government debt, and you could you could make an argument that a lot of that debt was incurred because of, well, it wasn't spent in our region and you could argue, I mean, you could say, well, look, look, there was some mismanagement there and we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have to suffer that. But you'll, it'll, you'll find it hard to avoid that uh, that government-owned corporation. Yeah, there. if I could just jump in there. Yeah, where you go, Bill? I, th- I think that's when we were talking about the forensics part of it. That we can show that the the debt was general was general debt, but it was passed over to to the the uh, utilities or whatever, and taking 
and parking the debt with them and taking money off them. So the, the forensics basically show it was actually general debt from the government and they went and parked it into those entities and took money off them. So that's part of the forensics part of it. Mm. So, so basically the, the argument still sits there. There, there is no legal way that, that the government's debt can be passed on to the new, new state. And no one, no one's been able to categorically turn around and says, no, that's wrong. Because my position and the general position in regards to the discussion is, if we leave, we leave the debt behind. That $20,000 per person, uh, debt that's been accumulated, we don't have to take any of that. And the other point that David Flint made is the provisions under the Commonwealth, under the Constitution and with the Commonwealth, to, for the Commonwealth to take over that debt if, if we are, are going to be saddled with some of that, that debt. So, so there's two components there. One, the argument is, no, we don't automatic, there's no, no capability of the Queensland government passing that transfer to, to the new state. And the other, other thing is, like you're talking about the utilities part of it, passed to the utilities or other agencies, there is provision for the Commonwealth actually to pick up that debt. So we can actually start with a pretty clean sheet. So quite possibly, uh, I'd have to look more into the constitutional issues there. Mm. So, I mean, David Flint would know more than, than me regarding the, the constitutional issues, so I'd, you know, I'd certainly listen to him on that. The reality is, though, I think, Bill, is that this will end up being determined... <coughs> by negotiation. I mean, the, the politics are, are going to be important here. I think it, there will be, if, if you're going to get it up, I think you're going to have to accept some of that debt. I just can't see how you can, how it's feasible you'll be Well, well that was the other, other point of David's argument, yeah. that a amicable political solution is the best solution for, yeah. for, for the uh, separation. And, and we agree with that, but it's not it's not a sort of, oh, well, we've got $100 million worth of debt. No, you've got 20% of the population. You get $20 million debt. That's not the case. That's all we're trying to point out. And that, that is, is, is better that we have a political solution in a, a negotiated agreement like it was supposed to happen under Brexit. But if it breaks down, it can walk, just walk, walk with no, no payments made at all. So, so that's, that's the sort of situation. But coming back to the general thing about a separate state, it's, it's, people will keep talking about the money side, but again, we always want to drive the political aspect, the fact that, you know, we've only got, um, uh, a small representat- political representation. Like if you compare the million people in central and north Queensland, um, to the 500 odd thousand in Tasmania. I mean, they've got, they've got their own, own parliament. They've got 25 members of the, um, lower house. They've got 15 members of the upper house. They've got five me- members of the house of representatives and they've got 12 senators. Now, <laughs> my argument and the argument will always be is, are the million people of central and north Queensland not deserving of at least the same political representation of the 500,000 in Tasmania? And if your answer is no, well, well, I'd like to see your reasoning why we don't deserve at least the same political representation in Tasmania. But if your answer is yes, well, then the only way we can achieve that is from as a separate state to have that sort of uh, level of representation. And, yeah. and that's... That's, that's the real push is political representation, uh, for the million people in central and north Queensland. And all the benefits like yeah. economic well, and, um, I agree social with that. Yeah. Would, would flow yeah. afterwards. Sorry, Gene, go. Yeah, yeah, look, I, I totally agree. I just want you to go into it with your eyes open. I want to make, I'd, I'd like to see the feasibility study of it because there's a lot of work involved and this is something I think <coughs> it would take you a de- at least a decade or possibly two decades to set up because you'll have to gradually develop your own systems and transition from uh, the Queensland Government. I think there might be a while where you're still relying on the Queensland Government for delivery of some services or some administration. 
and you'll just need to gradually set yeah, up I your th- own I systems. Yeah, I think that's correct. Yeah, yeah that's only fair but, enough. But if you look, go back to the enough. New South Wales, if you go back to the New South Wales uh, uh, situation back in '65 when they, uh, the Liberal and Country Party has formed uh, government for the first time in 41 years, and they agreed. Well, the Country Party forced the Liberal Party to agree to a referendum for a separate North, uh, New England state. The actual um, separation basically was worked out is that, um, of course, they they had the had the referendum which they didn't win, but the the basically the groundwork and it probably might have been simpler in those days, but the the if the referendum had have been uh, successful. The actual uh, transfer was required to happen in 18 months, which is a pretty huge task. But I mean, they're, they're the things that probably can happen if you've got your, got all your all your don't, all your chips laid in the right road. So it's it's a fairly. I don't think you've got 10 years to transfer powers. I mean, you've got to got to go first a lot faster than that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, you you, you could be able you, you would be able to do that. I I just suspect it'll it'll take longer. But look, yeah, I don't know that history. That's really interesting, Bill. That's really interesting. Yeah. I'll probably going to be going, 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 sorry, gentlemen. Sorry. Yeah. Just one of the other things you have to look at is the fact that in in our recent history, we've had a number of um, breakaway uh, states uh, forming. Uh, Forming new sovereign countries, and uh, they don't exactly get too much time after they break away. Like if you look at the breakdown of um, Yugoslavia and places like that, gee whiz! And once it broke down, there was there was new new national governments, and uh, that within within months. I'm sure I'm sure they had some real real serious problems, but uh, that's the sort of situation I suppose you're thrown into. Hmm. Mm. Well, I guess we'll have to pick this up again yeah. sometime. It's been fascinating. Yeah. I, I, have, I, real, I, I am going to have to get going. No, no, thank you. Thank you for your time, Gene. Look, look that'll bring okay. it to an end. Um, thank you very much, Gene Tunney, for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your time out of your week and uh, your evening. And thank you very much. And thank you as well to Bill Bates for joining. If anybody that's listening, uh, both this evening right now or later on into the podcast, you can learn more about the campaign for a new state for Central North Queensland at bootbrisbane.com. Likewise, you can go to Facebook and look at bootbrisbane.com's page, as well as Yes to a North Queensland State. Gene, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and uh, thank you for your time, and it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. Oh, thanks, David. Thanks, Bill. That was great. Yeah, no really enjoyed that, and no, no, uh, yeah, learned thanks. a lot, actually. Yeah, so. yeah, thanks, Gene. Yeah, good evening. Pleasure. See yeah, you, guys. Thanks, Gene, for your time, and I hope we can catch up again on... Good night, David. Good night.